Hello, everybody. This is Lisa Colon Lay from Spark My Muse podcast, and this is Soul School Lesson 326, Feeling Pain. I told you last time that I got a book by Henry Nowen at a used bookstore, but I also got another book, An Altar in the World by Barbara Brown Taylor, A Geography of Faith. This was a New York Times bestseller, and I had heard a lot about it, but seeing that it was only $3 or something at this used bookstore, I jumped at the chance to get it. And it's quite a beautiful book, wonderfully written. These are the chapters, The Practice of Waking Up to God, Vision, The Practice of Paying Attention, Reverence, The Practice of Wearing Skin, Incarnation, The Practice of Walking on the Earth, Groundedness, The Practice of Getting Lost, Wilderness, The Practice of Encountering Others, Community, The Practice of Living with Purpose, Vocation, the practice of saying no, Sabbath, the practice of carrying water, physical labor, the practice of feeling pain, breakthrough, the practice of being present to God, prayer, the practice of pronouncing blessings, benediction. It's a quite personal book in some ways, and Barbara Brown Taylor teaches at Piedmont College in rural northeast Georgia and is an adjunct professor of spirituality at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decanter. She's the author of at least 12 books, I'm sure more, more now since this was done. And this was an enjoyable book, and I just want to read a little bit about what she says about the practice of feeling pain. She writes, I have sat by as many deathbeds as sick beds in my life, and I have listened carefully. I have also watched what goes on in the room, including the complications I have brought to it myself. I have seen pain twist people and those who love them into exhausted rags with all the hopes squeezed out of them. I have also seen people in whom pain seems to have burned away everything extra, everything trivial, everything petty and less than noble, until they have become see-through with light. I wish I knew what accounted for the difference between the two, but coming up with a formula would be disrespectful for everyone involved. Generosity seems to help. When my friend Matilda lost her voice to Lou Gehrig's disease, she took up watercolors. The walls of her kitchen were papered with paintings of fleshly flowers that Georgia O'Keeffe would have coveted. You could not visit Matilda without getting a paintbrush stuck in your hand, too. She did not care if you felt like painting or not. Colors had become her language. If you wanted to communicate with Matilda, you spoke purple, you spoke fuchsia, you spoke mauve. When you were through with your grade school version of a Johnny Jump Up, she would clap her hands and honk like a trumpeter swan. When Pat could no longer raise from her bed, she asked for her jewelry box to be set beside her. If you did not find something you liked there, then she would send you to her closet to choose a sweater or a blouse. She worked hard to give away everything before she died, but people kept bringing her new things to replace those she had dispatched. When someone gave her a polished stone with a hole in it to wear around her neck, she did not know what to make of it at first. What is it? she breathed, turning it around and around in front of her face. Then she brought it close to one eye so that she could look straight through the round middle of the stone. Ah, she said, now I see. This is the way through. Rituals seemed to help, too. When Lucy was dying way before her time, The members of her house church gathered on her porch at night, singing hymns that she could hear through the windows of her bedroom. They covered her whole house with prayers so that you could almost see them floating over the roof like a luminous silk parachute. I do not know whether the hymns helped Lucy, but I know they helped the people who sang them. When Earl was facing cancer a second time, he was not sure how to prepare. He was not a churchgoer, having burned out on God during a painful childhood in parochial school. Like Thoreau, he preferred to go to the woods alone, but his illness made that difficult to do. So he sat in a spot of sunlight in his office instead, straightening his papers so that no one would have a hard time finding things when he was gone. When two of his grown children found him there on that day before his surgery, they asked if they could lay hands on him. Unable to think of a polite way to say no, he let them. Holding very still as one of them laid 
both hands on his hot round head and the other pressed down on both of his shoulders hard enough for him to know how heavy love could be. The three of them stayed that way for what was either a long time or no time at all. In that posture, it was hard to tell. Nothing was said during or after. It was only years later that Earl would bring it up, saying, Remember that day you touched me in the sunlight? I still remember that day. Paying attention also helps. Just that, paying attention to the pain. Pain can hurt so badly that it begs a reason, causing people to drum up all sorts of guilt and debt to go with it. Even those who may be on the right track will never get the proportions right, so I wish they would just give it up. Better they should stop doing the math and take a look around, since they may never see as clearly as they do when pain clears their sight. Plato once said that pain restores order to the soul. Rumi said that it lops off the branches of indifference. Quote, the throbbing vein will take you further than any thinking. Whatever else it does, pain offers an experience of being human that is as elemental as birth, orgasm, love, and death. Because it is so real, pain is an available antidote to unreality. Not the medicine you would have chosen, perhaps, but an effective one all the same. The next time you're in real pain, see how you feel about television shows, new appliances, a clean house, or your resume. Chances are, none of these things will do anything for you. All that will do anything for you is some cool water, held up by someone who has stopped everything else in order to look after you. An extra blanket might help also, a dry pillow, the simple knowledge that there is someone in the house who might hear if you had cried. Once when I was confined to bed for the better part of a week, I spent hours watching the sunlight that came through the slats of my wooden blinds move down the white wall of my bedroom. First thing in the morning, it made honey-colored rectangles with soft edges. By 10 a.m., the wall was striped with bands of light as straight as rulers. By noon, they looked more like rungs of a ladder, dappled with leaves from the winged elm outside my window. By two, they had lost most of their character as the sun moved over the roof of the house and left the front yard in deepening shadow. This may sound boring to you, but it was not. It was beautiful. It was reassuring. It gave me a place outside of myself to go. I did not have to do anything to make the light change. It had a routine it followed all by itself, whether I was awake to watch it or not. If I did not like the way the light looked at any given moment, I knew it would change. If I loved the way the light looked at any given moment, I knew it would change. I could not speed it up. I could not slow it down. Not to put too fine a point on it, the light was my life and I knew it. Paying attention to it, I lost my will to control it. Watching it, I became patient. Letting it be, I became well. There will always be people who run from every kind of pain and suffering, just as there will always be religions that promise to put them to sleep. For those willing to stay awake, pain remains a reliable altar in the world, a place to discover that a life can be as full of meaning as it is of hurt. The two have never canceled each other out, and I doubt they ever will, at least not until each of us, or all of us together, find the way through. And that was from An Altar in the World, the chapter called The Practice of Feeling Pain, written by Barbara Brown Taylor. There are many lovely passages in this book. I might pick it up another time to read something to you. But I thought that her reflections about feeling pain and allowing it to slow you down and give you patience and allow you to feel your humanness or wise and apropos. Most of us want to shut pain down, look the other way, or numb it out, and I think that that's quite a normal human response. So I hope that reading meant something to you, and until next time, I wish you blessing and peace. <laughs>